Hello, hello. Okay, it's back in normal. And then one more thing I want to mention is my office in this building is 204B. So feel free to stop by if you want to chat with me. All right, I'm pretty friendly. Uh, I almost come here every day, so you can catch me in my office very often, okay? All right, so that's enough. Uh, so let's begin our today's lecture. So today, I'm going to move on to uh, so-called persistent homology. So this is the main tool in the computational topology and topological data analysis field. So let's go over this concept by one simple example. And later, I'm going to show you a lot of example in the slides, OK? So that's the plan for today. All right, so let's recap what we have so far. So, so far, we've learned, you know, you're given some cubicle set, x, right? This is, can be any service can be some sort of weird shape of object, right? Given some cubicle set x, according to the last time lecture, we will be able to construct the chain complex, right? You can co produce uh, this chain complex, this is k from somewhere else, c k minus one, to go da da da, to C2, C1, C0, right? So given the complex, given an object, you'll be able to construct the chain complex. And from chain complex, you will be able to define the homology groups. Right? The homology group is defined as the kernel mod out the images. This is the definition, but keep in mind, we have the, the reason here, right? So the kernel we've seen last time really represent the cycles, right? It was shows the cycles in your object. So this is the cycle, and cycle is what we like, but we not only, but cycle is not enough because we wanna rule out the case where the cycle is someone else's boundary. So we need to mod out the boundary of one level up, right? So this is the current level. This is the level, one level up. So when you do the boundary, that's the, um, just to ensure the boundary is not cycle, okay? So that's how we define the homology. And then the key measurement, Bayesian number, can be obtained from the homology group. So. We spent 90 minutes last time to rigorously define the Betty number. This is going to be the dimension of the group. Okay. So this is what we have so far. Okay? Good. All right. So let's move on to persistent homology. What is persistent homology? Yes, there okay. is a cohomology theory. Yes. Okay. So let me show you by example, okay? Imagine now, imagine now I have a I have a complex, but it grows over time, right? So let me give you one very simple example. Suppose I have this concept of time. This is just for illustration purpose. So for time one, I'm going to see, I'm going to use here. All right, for time one, 
this is the complex I'm looking at. Time one and time two. More. Give a name A B. Time two, this complex grows. A B C and D. And when time equal to three, it's a very simple example. Time equal to three, I may have these edges grew together. When time equal to four, maybe I have this. When time equal to five, let me just use a little bit dash so I'm not confused. A, B, C, D. Okay. Right, so imagine you have this complex, you have this cubicle set, it grows over time. When time equal to one, you only have like two points. When time equal to two, the set grows to four points. And when time equal to three, it now becomes a two uh, disjoint intervals. And when time equal to four, you have those things. Okay? So this is uh, like this. All right? So let me just remind you, everything I wrote here, you can write down mathematically. All right? So for instance, this x1, this is the complex I'm looking at. x1, in this case, it's very simple. It just consists of two points. Because we're dealing with cubicle complex, everything is uh, close interval. So in this case, you, you can write like 0, 0, cross 0, 0, and uh, 0, cross 1, for, for instance. So this set is, has only one, two element, and this set consists of four element. Uh, you get the idea. And this set consists of two line intervals. So you're going to have like uh, 0 plus 0, 1, and you have 1, 0, comma 1, correct? those sets and at the end oh I forgot one more thing you have x4 x5 and lastly you have x6 which is simply um, the unit close interval okay good so this is a sequence of the set. And you notice this set has a relation. Right? When time equal to 1, you have only two points. When time equal to 2, you grow to like four points. So it has the subset relation. So this set is a subset of the next set. And uh, this is a subset of the next set. So you get this nested relation. In mathematics, this is called a filtration. So you have a complex, you have a filtration of the set. Oh, yes. <laughs> filtration. Sorry. OK. All right, good. And now, now you can use the knowledge from last time. Right. Last time, what we learned is given, given a complex, you, you, there exists a chain complex. Okay. Therefore, for the complex at time 1, there is a chain complex. Let me just write, let me just do it vertically so you can see it. C2, so let me emphasize it's 1. C1, C0, correct, right? 
So this superscript related to this superscript. This is the chain complex for x1. Good. And uh, similarly, you're going to have the chain complex for x2. Zero. Zero. Good. Right? And then you also have the chain complex for x3, x4, x5, and x6. Good. Okay. And now, this is the relation we have. Here you have the boundary map. Here you have the boundary map for this guy. And you also have the boundary map for this guy. Okay. And now, what is the relation crossover? Right. So because of the inclusion, because of the inclusion, inclusion induces a homomorphism. Therefore, this chain complex, there will be a relation between the column. It's naturally the induced homomorphism. All right. So let me just write one. All right. So now. I not only have this vertical chain complexes, I'm also having the relation between uh, columns. Oh, that's the same in, same induction. Good. So let me just write a couple more so you have the idea. So now what do we have? Now we are having a net relation. Here you have a sequence, so the sequence. Now we have the, this net relation. In this relation, you have the um, boundary map going down, and you have the inclusion map going to the right. OK? Good? OK. So. What's now? Right. So now you can talk about the homology. OK, so let me take my cheat sheet. So the homology of yes. Okay. So now you can talk about uh, the homology group. Right. So this is the definition. Ready? So before I move on. You can, from here, it has two components, right? Just make sure we are on the same page. So the Beatty number or the homology group for x1, so let me just quickly write down, make sure we don't forget. So the homology for this guy will be, okay. remember, this is going to be z squared. Because you have two components, when k equal to zero and zero otherwise, okay. And in this language, is you know the Bailey number is two, right? Okay. So let me just do more. I think you can do it too. So in here, you will find out, let me just write down the Bailey number. This Bailey number will be 4, correct? This Bailey number will be 2. What about this guy? 1, yes. What about this guy? 1, but that includes a whole, so beta 1 will be 1. And this guy, the Bailey number is what? Good, because you fill in, this is the full uh, disk. So you fill in, so the Bailey number is 1. Okay. So now, <clears throat> you can calculate the Bailey number. You can calculate the homology for each column. Now, what we are really interested in is, what is the relation from here? How this complex grows? That's what we want to know. Okay. 
So here's the definition of piece persistent, piece persistent case homology group piece persistent case homology group of Xi is the following H I P K this is defined to be psychos mod out B I B I plus P intersect with Z I K. Sorry. Okay, so it looks really, really uh, complicated, but you can see it from here. What I mean is, you want to ask this question. The question is, how long does a feature persist? Okay. So what is this V, A, I plus P? Yes, so the formal definition here is... Yes. Well, let me write down formally. This is the kernel of the boundary map IK. So from here, the superscript represents the time. Right, so I plus P means, uh, suppose you're looking at time one, right? You wonder how these two feature persist over maybe two units. Right? That's what the P is for. Oh, so B is the boundary. That's the boundary, yeah. B is the boundary. Okay. I plus P, P. This is the boundary. I think this is plus one. Yes. Yeah, that's the boundary. Yeah. Okay. So here is the question you we need to understand is how long there's a feature persist. Okay. So for instance, you can ask, this is two feature, two components here. Um, does it exist after after two time two times units? So one, two, does this guy still exist after time two? Okay. That's what the P persistent case homology group of X, what this very complicated thing represents. Good? Good, that's the key. All right, so let's take a look one more time. You can ask, those are two components, right, so the homology group is non-zero, right? So you can ask whether these two groups uh, persist or exist over maybe two time interval or three times interval, right? So you can ask like this. Okay, good. So let me give you one account, maybe a different example. Look at this example, right? You have beta two is two, so at this time, you can ask, okay, how does this feature uh, persist? Does it exist over one period of time? Right. Well, the answer is one of them does, one of them does not, right? Because the beta leading number changes from two to one, so one of them disappears. So one of this guy survive over this time period and one of them joined by the others that becomes a different component. Make sense? And all this information is here. Okay. 
you can write down everything. That would be a really good exercise. I encourage you to do it. You write down everything. Right, that's a very simple exercise. Write down everything, and you can write down exactly what that is. And you will find out that group um, will be different. Okay? Very good. <clears throat> Any questions at this point? <clears throat> Good. Okay. All right. Next, I'm going to talk about the persistent diagrams. forgot to mention one more thing. Uh, so from the graph, what you can see the definition is this is from the definition what you can see is this Z cycle mass the boundary. Right, the cycle if I looking at here, this is the cycle I'm looking at. Originally, if you want to calculate H1, right, this is the two you want to worry about. Right? In the original one, you want to calculate the kernel, mod out the boundary. Right? And what this definition says is, OK, this is my kernel. You want to know whether this cycle exists over you know, three periods of time, maybe. So you want to mod out this relation and this relation. Right? You want to see whether this group exists over two time period. Okay, that's what this definition is. Okay, good, very good. Now let me show you a different way of looking at this. So now I'm going to more towards to anal data analysis part. So far, everything here is very elegant mathematics. Okay? You can prove things. You can write down things like this. Okay. And now, this is the famous persistent diagrams. So persistent diagrams summarize all of the information, all of the information from this procedure from this position, okay? Position diagram. So here we go. Let me introduce some more notation. Definition, we say a positive cubes, if it creates creates a cycle when it enters. Okay. And the negative cube, or you can define as a negative complex, it, create, it destroys a cycle when it enters. Okay, good. All right, so what does that mean? So let me give you this table, right? So I have a time, I have time one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so my time, I have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, good. Okay. So at time one, I enter, I enter this filtration, I enter this process, I create two cycles, right? This is a zero dimensional cycles. 
So I create two cycles, so A and B, correct? A, B, well, let me just write down this A, B, C, D. When time two, I have two new uh, vertices coming in, and when time equal to three, I joined A, B, A, D, A, D, and B, C. And when time equal to four, I joined another one, A, B. When time equal to five, I do another one, C, D. And when time equal to six, I fill in the circle. Okay. So this is the entire process of this guy, right? When time equal to one, you have two vertices. When time equal to two, you enter new vertices. When time equal to three, you have one, well, two edges. So use this definition. If this is a positive cube, if it creates a cycle when I enter this position. So when I enter time one, I see two zero dimensional um, cycles. So this is going to be plus, this is going to be another plus. Okay. When time equal to two, I see additional two uh, cycles. So I write plus, okay? Good. All right, so now things to be very interesting now. So when time equal to three, what do we see? With time equal to three, you destroy uh, cycles because you have four cycles here. Now it becomes two cycles, right? So when you enter this guy, those two are negative cubes. So this is negative, this is negative. Good. When time equal to four, again, you see a changes. Two cycles become one cycle, so this is gonna be a negative. So Sorry. in that equation, it's yeah. four, right? Mm. So why do you choose to write this as A, B? Because it's the it's not really exactly A, B, right? So you do some contraction before you write A, B, so I'm, I mean, oh, yeah, so that's my the same comma is the same, but. My bad, yeah, that's. So how do you write, right? I mean, it's not exactly A, B, right? It's a, oh, yeah, it's A, B. What do you mean? Oh, you mean, oh, you're picking the, the one that fits in the cycle, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can also say, right, A, B. Right? That's what I'm saying. Like, it's the choice is not unique, that's what I'm saying. Right. Well, yes. yes. It's in, in time three, yes, the cho choice is not unique. Right? So this is AD. I, I put AD in front, but you can really put BC well, in front. Well, I'm about uh, number four. Because number four, you are the... AB here. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, but I say that you can also mm -hmm. write this as uh, AD. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> or PA. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So the choice is not unique, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Because what we really care is the set, not the order, mm -hmm. right? So we only, what I write, I only care about the set here. So the set here is like 0 plus 0, 1. This is a close interval. I care about that. Okay, so this is just the shorthand of writing the, the interval. Yes, thank you for bringing that in. Any other questions? Okay. And now when time equal to five, right, can you tell me it is a positive or a negative? Positive? Yes, very good observation. It is positive, right? Because look at the definition. Uh, if it creates a cycle. So when time equal to five, this is made out zero is one, and you move on to the next time, you create a one-dimensional cycle. Right? You create a one-dimensional cycle. So that's a positive. Uh, 
Q. Okay. What about the last one? Negative? Yes, it's a negative. Okay? Because when you fill in, when you fill in the cycle, you remove this guy, so you destroy the one-dimensional cycle. So that's a negative. Okay. Good? Okay. All right. So how, how do we make sense of this positive negative, right? So now what I want to do is a pair. So persistent diagram is a set of pair, well pairs, number. Okay, ready? So I'm going to go Yes. All right, ready? So I'm going to do this. Each negative is going to pair with a positive. Okay? So I'm going to this is all positive, it's all positive, it's fine. The first time I hit negative is the place I'm going to pair, a number. So when time three, I pair, well, I have a negative, so what do I need to pair? I need to pair with the first cube that uh, consists of this. Okay, let me say one more time. This edges consist of A and D. It's the line segment of AD, AD, right? So you have a negative. So you either pair with A or D. Right? You either pair with A or D. And here is the only artificial thing coming here. This is called the elders rule. Right? You can do either way, but in this community, uh, we we enforce the elders rule, right? So this is called the elders rule. Basically, the joke is, no, the youngest die, all right? So we keep the oldest feature because we want to see as, the, the long, as long feature as possible, okay? So when you pair, you can choose a, either A or D, but A has uh, is far away from there. So you want to pair with the first guy. So you pair this guy with three. Okay? Okay. And then you move on to B, C, and B, that negative, need to pair with another positive. So it's either pair with B or C. And because C is youngest, so I pair this guy with C. Okay? And then you move on to here. You have A, B. Good. So I can pair this guy with B. In this case, they are the same. You can pair with either one. All right? So I can just do B here. Okay? And then positive phi and then negative and the only way this guy to pair is this guy. Right, so this pair with well yes here. So the number five you only need to pair with other. So you only pair with the negative one? Okay, I see. So the negative pair with the Yeah, you only pair with negative. So and then you will see there's one positive neighbor pair, correct? This is what we call the infinite generator because that one never dies. So throughout this process, it's there, it's there, it is still there, this is still there, this is still there. So that homology group exists for the entire time, okay? Exactly. Okay, so that's what we like to say, uh, uh, infinite generator. So let me write down. So now we have the pairs, right? So the persistent diagram for this process, persistent diagram for this process can be recorded as the following. Right, so you have 
H zero's information. Here, one four, one comma four, two comma three, two comma three, two of them. Okay, and you have this guy never dies, so you have one infinity. Right, so this is the convention in this community. People will write infinity at the second corner to indicate, okay, that's the infinite generator. Okay. Do, do people feel like if we are one, we have two A and B are one. So do people like distinguish like A and B? No. no. <laughs> yeah, you can you can do the yeah you can do. Like one have A and B, right? It's not really the only one. But okay. Yes. Yes. So that's a very good point. So we made the choices here, and we also made the choices here. Okay. And then we have another information. It's about H1, this guy. So it's born at 5 and die at 6. All right. So this is the persistent diagram. Those pair of numbers record all of the information about this process. Okay. Good. Very good. And uh, in the first coordinates, we like to say, give it a name. This is called the first coordinate. The second coordinate is called the death coordinate. Ooh. Good. So what I mean is, here's what you can make sense of. You can, one pair represents one topological features, or one cycle, one homology group, whatever you want to mention. This is really the homology group of this, okay? Just a number there. All right, so if you have a pair, you're gonna see a group or a you're gonna see a topological feature. So this feature, you first time you see it is at time one. Okay? And when time equal to four, that feature disappears. Okay, that's how you make sense of this pair. And then you have two pairs of numbers. They have the same birth and death coordinates. That means this feature, the first time you see it is at two, and the last time you see it is at three. Well, not the last time. At time three, you don't see it anymore. Okay? So you can see it from here. When time equal to two, you have four vertices. When time equal to three, it becomes two. Right? So two of them disappears and not record in here. Okay? And one of them, first time born, and never dies. So that's the, always you're gonna have this infinite generator. Okay. Good. Okay. So this is the persistent uh, diagrams. Okay, good. All right, so now let's move on to So now we are really, okay, yeah, okay. So now what we have is this very abstract definition summarized in the way of this a lot of pairs of num numbers. Okay. All right. Now I want to talk about one more thing, and then I'm going to show you a lot of examples. Well, some of the examples. All right. This is called the stability. Why this is so useful nowadays is because persistent diagram is stable. Right? So let me give the proper definition. What do I mean by a stable? Okay. What I mean is, <clears throat> imagine you have a small perturbation on your underlying function. Right? So. Um, Right. Suppose you have a function f. Right. This can be a very general function, or like the function I mentioned last time, uh, x squared. You can com 
you can consider the sub-level set. You can consider the sub-level set. And what do you see is like the following. Like we did this last time. This is the sub-level set. Cool. And you can use very simple one-line proof. You can prove that the sub-level set of this function is actually a filtration. So you have a function, then that's a natural way to create the filtration. Right? So now you have a filtration, you can compute the persistent homology. Okay, right, a continuous <laughs> function, for sure, yes. Let's just say very nice function, thank you. Very nice function, right? so this is a filtration. Correct. Then you can compute the persistent diagram, so on and so forth. Okay. And now why this is so popular nowadays is because the persistent homology persistent diagram is stable. In a way, uh, if, if now you have a small perturbation of f, a small perturbation with some noise, then your persistent diagram is only a small perturbation of the original one. Okay? So that's very, very important property of the persistent homology. And it is very, very important because, because when we do analysis, when we do data analysis, this seems to be very simple but very fundamental. You don't want to have a measurement that will, you know, does not respect to the noise, right? If you have an, a measurement, if you add a noise, your measurement become totally different then you may not want to use that uh, method, correct? So this is useful. This is the stable. So let me write down that. So the formal definition, this is the theorem by the people in Duke, uh, John Hare. Uh, oh, I forgot the name. Yeah, the group of people. So let me, I will show you the reference. It's in 2005. This is what they discovered. The distance, so use this DF, denote the persistent diagrams of F. Right. Okay, so the distance between two diagrams, and I will show you what this distance. The distance between two diagrams is less than or equal to the nth norm of the function. So fg are some nice function. This is the result, okay? So you have persistent diagram, the distance between two persistent diagram, you know, a small perturbation of the function, uh, you get a small um, value on your persistent diagrams. So, so your persistent diagram is uh, this one or you can see it? Yeah, this one, ah. this one, set of the points. Okay, this pair. Yes, a pair of points. So, System, yes. So you can think about the specific like, so can you think about this as like an edge or as a graph? Or? This is more like a, mm, a multi set because we allow the multiplicity. So it is oh, more okay. like the set, multi set. So what is the theorem? Well, what is the distance here? How do we define 
uh, the distance between persistent diagrams, right? So persistent diagram is just the multi-set like here. You have like that, okay? So this is called the bottleneck distance. This is called the bottleneck distance. It defined in the following. You want to take the infinite over all possible bijection, and you take the supreme over this. Okay, let me let me write down here. The bottleneck distance defined to be the following. Right. This is a just set, can be a multi-set, whatever. This is equal to take infimum and then take supremum over x minus If you're coming from computer science or some graph theory, uh, this you may maybe not you may be familiar with this, but let me explain what's going on here. This is the bijection. Right, this is a bijection between x and y. So what this distance means is you want to first find out the pairs, find out the, the matching, right? So you want to match x and y, you find out the match, and then you find out the distance, but you want to find out the best matching, so you have the smallest uh, changes, okay? So it's like the, the, the house of distance, something like that, you have the infant soup, okay? Is it, is it always the case on small perturbation so is it possible that small perturbation will make it impossible by diagrams? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, that's why, yes, very, very, very good question. That's why we have a very weird thing happening in the persistent diagram. I should write this thing down. The persistent diagram consists of the set of the pair point, and also, also it includes uh, includes this. Okay, so in a way, there is an infinitely many points on the diagonal point. So imagine if you have two sets, they have two different number of points. Because of this, I can match to the di uh, diagonal, so they have the same number of points to do the matching, to do the bijection. Okay, so, yes, that's a very good question. And then in fact, I'm going to show you one example, very simple example to illustrate that. Let me do it here. Suppose I have two persistent diagram. Suppose I have like this. There it goes. I have a point like this. One, two, three, five, four, fifty. And I have another, it's like three, four and 10, 30. Okay. So how do I calculate the bottleneck distance between these two uh, sets, right? So keep in mind, this is important. You can have infinitely many uh, points on the diagonal. You can pick one if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So in this case, this is for the purpose is to, you can make those two the same number, right? because now this is number of this guy is three, this is two, how do you do the matching? So 
keep in mind, you have infinite resource here. You can pick as many points as you want. Okay. So here's one possible matching. Let me just show you. One possible matching. So you may you may do the following matching. You may do like this. One, two, match to, I don't know, 10, 30, match to here. And uh, one, two. 150. Oh, oh, sorry. This is 150. My bad. 1, 2, 150, and 450, 3, 4, 10, 30. Yes, there we go. And then maybe I pair this guy with that guy. No. 3, 4. You know, there are infinitely, infinitely many ways to do the matching. And uh, the last one, the left behind, you can match to any point on the diagonal. So any point I can match to like 4, 4, you can match to 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, and so on and so forth. Okay. And once you have a matching, and then you calculate the distance between these two points. So the distance between these two points is uh, the maximum distance. So you have 28. 46, you have a 46, and then you take the maximum one. It's 46. Okay. How do you compute the distance? Just point-wise distance and point-wise distance and take the maximum one. Or L1, is L1 distance basically? L infinity. L infinity. Yes. Point Y and then choose the maximum. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. And there's another possible way you can do it, right? You can also do, you can also try to do, I don't know, you can try to match this two, maybe match this two, right? You can also match this to three, four. That will be 10. 30, you can match 150 to any point, right? So I can do, uh, I don't know, 20, 20, and just give you an idea what happened here, okay? So here, this is really the freedom you can do. Uh, okay. And then you can calculate the distance Right, the distance here will be 1, the distance here will be 20, the distance here will be 30, right? And then you pick the largest one. Okay. And then you have to do this process a lot of times because now you find out this matching, this matching, you want to pick infimum. So you want to pick the smallest one. So this is better than this one. Is this distance, but distance. But is this distance uh, important for theory, uh, or is it feasible to really compute it in practical examples? Because it seems there are two optimizations, and you need to go over bijections. But it feels like it's something important for theory, but practically maybe <coughs> not computable. Um, yes and no. All right, so. The answer is yes, this is computable. So on Monday, I will show you the code so you can compute the distance. And uh, the, the no part is it's going to be very expensive, as you can imagine. This, this it's a very expensive process. Uh, like the, this is the Gromov's outer distance, something like that. Even Gromov's outer distance. Yes, yes. But this is like that, right? Yes, exactly. Very similar, yeah. yes. And this is not invented by those guys. This is real, um, some 
people in graph theory, they already have the concept of bounded distance. Okay, good. Okay, speaking of that, so Monday, this is what we're going to do. Monday, uh, I hope you can bring the laptop, hopefully MATLAB, I'm going to use MATLAB. Um, and then if you happen to run Linux or Mac, then you will be able to run uh, the distance, all right, because uh, Windows is such a nightmare um, for, for scientific computing, but so if you, if you have the MATLAB ready, then that's all you need next week. I will show you step by step how to run the persistent, how to compute a persistent diagram, okay? I guess in, say in this condition, right? Yeah. I guess you, because in the end you want to pick the infima, right? Mm. So I guess in the machine, you probably want to pick the, the, the one on the diagram that is the minimal one, right? So it will show, reduce your computation data. Yeah. In the last one, right? This one, yeah. The, the one you pick on the diagram, right? Mm -hmm. You probably want to pick the one that is the cross, the smallest one to the one. Because in the end, you do want to do the right? Yes. So, yes. so if you don't want to choose the upstream, right? Because you don't want to. A lot of it are wasted, right? So exactly. You, know, you can do the in the last day, so you don't need to do so many in the end, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. And that's why I hope this gives you some idea. This also matches the idea in persistent diagram because in persistent diagram we have the pair of the points right and what you remember is if if say i have one and 50 right, what i mean is you first time see this feature is at one and the last time you see this feature is at 50. so your total time may be just like 70 maybe so this feature lives for a long period of time, right? So that's very likely to be a very important feature, okay? Unlike the point like this, you're born at two and you quickly disappear at the next one. So that may be not very important, right? So in a way, what people can understand the persistent diagram is if your point is really close on the diagonal, that seems to be not important, right, in general. And this bottleneck distance somehow captured that uh, idea, right? So you want to pair with the point. If the points are very close to diagonal, you want to pair with them there. And then you want to pair the longer life one with the longer life one. That's the, the principle. All right, so very good. I'm going to show you more examples. So maybe I will need help. How can I? While we are waiting, can you find the right answer? Can you find the best matching for this example? Quiz, <laughs> quiz time. What is the best matching? In other words, can you find another matching that, that is smaller than 30?
Yes. Seventy five. Met this to twenty five. Then what do we have? We have twenty five. Okay. Good. It it is the best one? Any twenty? Uh huh. The best one is twenty. How? How do you do that? How do you do the matching? So the third one, you're talking about this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can actually mm -hmm. choose the pair. Right. So you can ignore it. Because you can, you can choose one like the 10, 20, 10, 30. No, you have to choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to choose the diagonal. You have to choose like this. Mm. Ten. Ten. And, uh, no, you only you can only choose <laughs> you can only choose the same number. Yes, you can only choose the same number. Right. Any other thought? Minimize one one minus B and I think the best one is is this. If you match you match this to ten thirty, and you match this to twenty seven, then you have twenty three. Okay, so that's um, anyway. Okay. It's a very fun exercise. You should try to do it. Yay. OK. So let's look at some example. right? So we are moving from very abstract homology theory, algebraic topology thing, to persistent homology, and then to pair of points. And now we're going to see a lot of examples. Right, so Monday we're gonna work on the code and on Wednesday we're going to show you some of the um, applications. Okay? Alright, so image data. This is what I'm interested the most. Um, so image data, right? Image consists of a lot of pixels, right? So how does that work in so a pixel is just a point. Then you can think about a pixel in the cubical homology that will be a unit square. All right. A pixel, you can use that thing to represent. Then you can calculate the persist or you can calculate the homology for a binary image. Right? So for instance, in this example, Imagine black is the color. Black is something is there. The black is there. Right? And there are a lot of small pixels, and that consists of this thing here. And what is the Betty number? What is the um, Betty number of this image? Right, the answer is 320. So you should see there are one connected component here, another connected component here and anything else will be connected in the middle part. So you have three connected components, correct? And there are 20 one-dimensional hole, so you will see one-dimensional hole, one-dimensional hole, one-dimensional hole. You can count, there are 20 of them. Good. Good, all right. The next example, all right, this is a 3D example it's beyond the human ability, right? So you, no way you can count by hand or by, by your eyes. So we really need the, the algorithm 
to help. Right. So how, how fast the computation move? This one, yeah. this one is fast. In real time, this is. I want to say like thirty seconds. Okay. Yeah. Binary. This is very fast. And this is one-dimensional hole, so maybe you can see it somewhere here. Here is the one-dimensional tunnels, right? There are thousands of them. Okay, and now binary image may be not so interesting. Um, what we really see is the grayscale images, right? So how do you compute the homology on a grayscale image? Right? You can use the concept of the sub-level set, right? You can compute, you can create a lot of binary images, right? Those binary image forms the filtration. So now you have a filtration, you will be able to compute the persistent homology and therefore persistent diagram of this grayscale image. Cool? Just to show you one more time, right? You can view the grayscale image as some sort of function, two-dimensional function, right? You calculate the sub-level set. That's how you can create the uh, filtration. So, for people, mm. they make some instantaneous smoothing first, and then so the computer will be faster, or it doesn't matter. That's a very good question. So you you can do smoothing. Um, you smooth the graph. Right? You're gonna have some like using some. Yes, you can certainly do that. Yes. But will this improve or doesn't really matter? I think the speed here is not a question, okay. right? The question is, is when you smooth, mm -hmm. will you smooth out the real important feature? Mm -hmm. right? So that's maybe the question you, uh, we, we, we like to know. Yeah. Okay, this computation is so fast, it's real time. It's uh, no problem here. Okay. All right. And this is just summarize what we have about the persistent diagram. And I hope by this time you have pretty good knowledge, so I don't want to repeat it. So here I just want to mention one very small thing is long lifespan generators, right? That refer maybe is the robust feature. Right. So look at my words. My words is using a very vague word because nowadays some researchers find out, you know, show life generator, you know, commonly considered as noise, but later find out it has important, uh, important application too. So I would like to say it with conservative way, right? So it's noisy, but maybe helpful. Okay. Okay, here we go. So this is one of the example, right? So you can do the sub-level set. Right? So one more time. Play. Okay, yes. And this is the grayscale image and this is the sub-level set at 474. Right? And this is the persistent diagram of this grayscale image. This is the persistent diagram of this grayscale images. Okay? Good. And you can see this is the birth value, this is the death value, this is exactly the thing we are talking about here. But now it has more points, right? So you want to take a look. Right? The point here means, this point means the first time you see it is 30 something, and the and it dies at maybe 30 something. So around here is maybe due to the noise, right? So it's like that. Cool. And you can look at the long life generator, the generator that is away from the diagonal. That looks like the robust feature, right? What is the robust component here? Right? You have one component, the background, you have another small component in the middle. You have another component here. You have another component here. You have another component here. So you have five different components, and that's in here. OK? 
And there are, roughly speaking, there are one one-dimensional hole, another one-dimensional hole, another one, another one, another one. Total are eight of them. And it's recorded here. Cool? Good. And there is a research area to, you may ask me oh, what happened here. So far, the best answer I can give you is that looks like the, the formulation, right? You can look at there are a lot of dots here, a lot of one-dimensional hole that's right here, right? So it's the transition in order to build up the actual image. Right? So that's a lot of transition generators there. But it is a current active research on what is, or try to understand this transition. It's a very important uh, part too. Okay. But for now, let's just focus on you know, looking at and get some idea. And this is another example. Right? Let's just focus on the long life generator. Right? This is the H1, H0, this is H1. You can see there are two generators. The red dot represents the infinite generator, right? the, the one that never dies. Right. So you can look at here, you have one component roughly right here in the background. So you have two different components that's captured over there. And uh, how many one-dimensional hole? You have one-dimensional hole, another one, another one here, but notice this is somehow connected. So really, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so that's a hole here. Let's give you one more example, and this is like the rise. Right, so calculate the persistent diagram. There's only one connected component, long life generator, and you have a lot of one-dimensional hole. You can see it there. Okay. Cool. This is an image from material science. Uh, this one, I don't want to draw a conclusion, right? This is, you, know, you have to do your analysis, right? It looks like, it looks like you have two humps, right? So these two humps may refer to those two different colors, and then maybe refer to their different materials, right? And you have a lot of long life generators here. This is H1. So that may be seen here. This is one dimensional hole here. There's another one dimensional hole here. That's the information there. Okay. And there are something like that. Cool. So, so far, <clears throat> what happened is you can compute it. And then you can see the persistent diagram. And that's so cool, right? But the next step is try to make sense of this diagram and try to draw conclusion from here. That's the active research now. All right. The next example I'm going to show you is the point cloud data. All right. Suppose you see a data like this. Right? A lot of data is more than two dimensional. Right? This is just a toy example. Look at this, what do you think it looks like? What shape do you think this it is? It looks like a circle, right? It looks like a circle. So maybe that represents like a house price, right? So this is one house, this is another house. Maybe this house somehow formed like a circle, right? But how do you see it? You see it spray, but how do you do it in persistent diagram, right? So in the point cloud data, in this world, you don't do the cubical homology anymore. What you do is something called a simplicial homology. It's more traditional uh, algebraic topology subject. 
is the world built up by triangles, a lot of triangles, okay? So that's basically what happened. And the idea is, low theta point, you grow with some bow. This is the original point, and each time you grow with certain radius, maybe three, like, like that, and when the ball intersect with each other, you're going to connect with the neighbors, okay? Connect the points with the triangle. You build up the simplicial complexes. That's how you can view this data. But the point here is as you grow the ball, as you grow the ball, you start to see the shape of the data. Okay. As you start to see, right, now it looks like a circle, right? When you when the ball is big enough, you start to see this uh, circle. Okay? And when, you, when your ball is really, really large enough, then everything becomes just a point. Is that cool? So this is a very common way to do persistent homology on the point cloud data. You just grow the ball. When do you choose to start and think that it will be based on the data? I mean, because right again, Exactly. So the question, as I mentioned before, you can easily get the persistent diagram, but how to analyze the persistent diagram is what we do now. Yes. So you, the, the, the example I show you later, you will still see a persistent diagram of this type, and you will, uh, you will see a one, com one component that lives for a very long period of time, then you will say, oh, that looks like a circle. So this data may form a circle. Okay. And one example, in a point cloud data, this is one of the earliest application, uh, is they do this for NBA player, and this is a very popular um, Topic, right? So, in 2013, the group of people in Stanford, right, this is the founder of the persistent homology, he actually uh, built a company. So, he's not in Stanford anymore, he's full time in this company. So, one of their company's project is to study the NBA players, right? Traditionally, in basketball game, what we do is you, usually you have point, point guard, you have forward, you have center, you have five different positions, right? <clears throat> but in their analysis, they use topological method of persistent homology. They find out there are actually 13 different positions in NBA, right? So they, 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 they give a name like one of the kind and something like that. So um, it really is very interesting, but the idea is right here, right? So one point can be referred to, you know, Curry, LeBron James, you know, you take all of their stats, that will be the one point, and then you put all of the NBA player stats on the point cloud, that's what we will see. But the dimension will be maybe 30 dimension, 20 dimension, you won't be able to see it from here, but topology will be able to show you, oh, that looks like a 13 long life uh, features. That's how they can conclude there are 13 different type of players. Okay. Okay, I hope you learned something. And uh, next time, please bring your laptop and we're going to do some hands-on dirty work together. Okay? And. Uh, have a good day, and uh, feel free to stop by my office. We can talk if you want. One final question. Oh, yeah. When they did that, it's coming. Do, you, do you know uh, which year was it? Yes. Around, like, roughly. 2013, I believe. I can find out the... Let me see if I can do it. Because I'm curious, mm -hmm. uh, deep learning skyrocketed uh, first real stuff in March in 2010. Mm -hmm. So it's really skyrocketed in 2015, 14. 
So I think this is 2000. I don't know. <laughs> well, so far, this is a very interesting question. The deep learning and um, TDA, so far, we are not on the same track, I want to say. Because if you say they established company like two years ago or something like that, I would ask uh, how they pitched against deep learning and what is right, the benefit. Right. I think they, they did it earlier than they it did, wasn't there. <laughs> they did earlier. I think they did it 2013, around the time, I believe. But, but I think yeah. Yes, it's different. It's different. Yeah, talk about NBA players, deep learning has um, super deep learning allows on supervised learning. Mm -hmm. and it, it is very, very kind of powerful. Mm -hmm. there. So it is a sort of unsupervised learning as well. This yeah. way to classify NBA players. Yeah. But another another point is people don't understand deep learning very well. Yeah, you don't know why. What's inside the, the theory, exactly. neural network? What's going on there? Yeah, but it has very developed methods to really prove that what that this is not, not a generalization. Yeah. And in practice, it works well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And in fact, this one only one work I've seen related to neural network and persistent homology is neural network tend to over feed very bad. So like if you you put like one devil pixel, the banana become 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 other 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 thing. You heard about this story? Right? And there's a way the topological method will come in and help to uh, to avoid uh, this kind of overfeeding. So I yeah, I don't. I don't want to compete, right? Because to compete, that's going to be really <laughs> difficult. But I want to I somehow to whether it made yeah. your life tougher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, I was I, I will say they were not just doing TDA. They, TDA is one of the main tool, but they must have done something uh, deep learning as well. This is the company's name. Yeah. And then this is the data layer. So there are 13 of them. There are role player, role player, ball handler, three pointer, rebounder. You know, so 13 different positions. So if you're interested, uh, you can take a look. And that's the technique we will use Monday. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think 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 I